So I am ecstatic, thrilled, all of those, uh, all those words, uh, all those adjectives to and introduce to you today, Dave Rhodes, who has uh, graciously agreed to come and share the gospel and preach with us today, preach for us today. Uh, Dave is a great friend. He has been working with us as part of a team over the last several years. Uh, we've gotten to know him and others through Unique. He's one of the co-founders of Unique. For those of you who've been through that, uh, there's, Dave Rhodes is all over over that. Uh, Also, uh, Future Church, he is now the founder of Clarity House Ministries. He is the strategic director for the Faith Family of Churches, Uh, and he he and his family are part of Faith Snowville, and they live in that part of the city. Uh, He and his wife, Kim, and his daughters, Emma, Izzy, and their son, uh, Frankie. And uh, Dave is an avid golfer, he is a former collegiate soccer player, an athlete to the core. I was told of the first thing you can tell by the way he moves. He's just, you know, he's like a cat. Um, but no, Dave has Dave uh, uh, been a part of, uh, partner with Exponential. He is a sought after speaker, an author. Uh, he's worked in the past with 3D Movements, which is a global discipleship ministry founded by Mike Breen. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. This is the guy when it comes, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to discipleship. And when it comes to preaching, I always, I always steal everything that he says. My one regret about having him preach this morning is I'm not gonna ever be able to preach this sermon to you guys because I would sit and just wholesale copy. He just has an incredible way of delivering God's truth with power and clarity. Above all else, Dave is a great friend and a true brother in Christ. And so I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Dave Rhodes. Good morning, church. So great to be here with you. I have such deep respect for your leaders, Jody and Jonathan, um, for Elaine and Galen and Elise and John, and uh, the opportunity that I've had to just be here over the last few years, kind of blow the surface and to get a chance to um, invest in the good work that I believe God is doing here. And it's great to be here with you this morning. Welcome to the 1045 service, or 11 o'clock service, I guess. It's 1045 at our church. Um, I always say, you know, there's two types of people in the world. There are morning people and people who are not morning people, right? This is the not morning people group, right? I'm not a morning person. I'm barely Christian before about 12 o'clock, right? So I I totally get it. And uh, that's why I need worship to warm my heart up to God, because I don't wake up necessarily in that direction. Uh, Well, I got to tell you, I love vacation. Vacation is my favorite six months of the year. I'm just kidding, I don't have six months of vacation. That's called being a college student. That's what that is. Um, I have a college student, but I'm not a college student. I try to recreate like I am a college student because I love being in college so much. But I love vacation. Vacation for me is really about three things. I wanna sleep in, I wanna eat big, and I wanna play golf. Those three things, if they're there, then it's gonna be a good vacation. My wife, Kim, she wants to be at a beach. She loves the beach. I mean, she hears from God at the beach. Actually, we're about to head to the beach after this service, so we're heading on vacation as we're talking about vacation here. And I love vacation. Now, I I like the beach community because oftentimes there's lots of golf courses around there. Uh, but to be honest with you, I'm just not a huge fan of hot sand and all the hot all the places that hot sand can get. Most of the time on my day, if we're at the beach, I'd rather just be at the pool. I've, I've seen and heard too many Jaws stories to actually get in the water. Every time I get in the water, I just feel like dunna, 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 it's coming to get me. And so most days, I would rather just be at a pool beside the beach. But there are a few things that will get me in the water. Whenever I get a chance to go snorkeling or scuba diving, I love just getting below the surface and seeing all of the life before the surface. And I remember a couple years ago, my family was on vacation in Key Largo. My dad pastors a church, and someone in the church had given us opportunity to go down to their vacation house there. We spent the week in Key Largo hanging out, when at the end of the week, the homeowner came down and said, I want to take you guys out on a couple snorkel dives. So we got in the boat and we went out there in Key Largo, went to a couple different places. But on this particular day, it wasn't the shark that got me. It was something they called the barracuda. 
I don't know if you've ever been in the water with a barracuda, but it's kind of a frightening figure. I mean, it's got a mouth that is full of sharp teeth, and it swims with its mouth open, just kind of letting you know what it could do to you. It, it, it hovers around you and looks into you with these eyes that look like, like they can look like right through you, like they can stare into your soul. It's like you need to start confessing your sins to the barracuda in that moment. And I remember on this particular trip, I'd gotten out of the boat, and when I did, there were two four-foot barracuda that were just hovering around me and my brother and my dad. It was kind of a moment where, honestly, I just wanted to get back in the boat, except there was something in the water that I really wanted to see. Jesus was in the water. I'm not joking. Jesus was actually in the water, or at least a nine-foot statue of Jesus is in the water. They call it Jesus of the Abyss. 25 feet below the surface stands a nine-foot, 2,500-pound bronze statue of Jesus with his arms open wide. It was modeled after the same cast that sits off the coast of Italy. And in this moment, I want to get to Jesus, but between me and Jesus are these two four-foot barracudas. And I'm sitting there in that moment thinking, what am I going to do? Am I going to go? Am I going to get back in the boat? And I do what any normal person would do in this moment. I place my brother and my dad between me and the barracuda and swim around. It was amazing when I got down to Jesus under the surface, there is a psalm at the bottom of his feet as he stands with his arms open wide that says, there's nowhere you can go that I'm not here. I, I want to start with that this morning because when it comes to following Jesus, there's always something in the water between us and him. It would be great if following God happened in a bubble, but the truth is following God happens in a bubble. I mean, it happens in a battle. And oftentimes as we try and follow God, there are things in the water, so to speak, that try to rob us of, our, of God's best. And if we're not careful, those things will overcome us in a way that leaves us getting back in the boat. But this morning, for a few moments, I want to talk to you about what it looks like to become an overcomer. How do we dare to follow God even in the middle of threatening moments in our life? There's no better place to talk about that than in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to look at one of our most famous stories. Even if you haven't been around church or you're on the edge of skepticism, you probably heard the story that we're going to read this morning. It's one of our most famous. You can think about famous stories that cultures and uh, people have, and as people of the book here, the Bible, there are several of our famous stories. Like you can think about Daniel and the lion's den, or you think about Jonah and the whale or the fish, and you think about David and Goliath. And so this morning, we're coming to this familiar passage of Scripture, and I want to take it memento style, meaning that we're going to go to the end of the movie, so to speak, and then work our way backward. So we're going to come to the climactic scene here that starts in verse 40, and I want us to hear this scene, and then we'll work back as we think about what it means to be an overcomer. Verse 40, here's what the Bible says. It says it this way. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag. With a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and beasts of the field. Those are fighting words there. And I love starting here in verse 45 because David gets to talk a little trash back, all right? So David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the enemies of Israel, armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to, to, to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. 
Today I will give your carcasses, the carcasses of the Philistine army, to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And this is where, if it was a movie, it would begin to zoom in and the music would begin to pick up. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. What we read here in these 10 verses is a defining moment in David's life. It's a defining moment in Israel's life. And we love these kinds of moments, don't we? Moments where ordinary people do extraordinary things. Moments when underdogs win the day. It's the reason why movies like Hoosiers and Rudy and Rocky and Miracle just kind of captivate our heart. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're surfing, you know, the TV or the web and all of a sudden you come through TBS playing an old Hoosiers movie, you can't help but just kind of jump into it. Because there's something in our hearts that loves these kinds of stories. And this for us is a familiar story. It's a story you've probably heard so many times, you just come to expect the ending. But it's rarely the kind of story that we expect in our own lives. See, sometimes I think we forget that the Bible characters didn't realize they were Bible characters. That as David is facing Goliath in this moment, he's never heard the story of David and Goliath. All he knows is he's in the middle of a struggle. All he knows is that he's in the middle of a test. David doesn't know he's in his defining moment. All he knows is as he's following God that there is stuff in the water with him. And the scene here is kind of bleak because as David arrives on the scene, everyone is cowering in fear. You've got Israel on one side of the mountain, you've got the Philistines on the other side of the mountain, and every day an eight-foot tall giant named Goliath, whose name means exposer or revealer is one way you could interpret the name Goliath. And oftentimes in the scripture, if you look at someone's name, you see what it is that they do. And this revealer, this giant, is exposing everyone that he comes around. So that Israel is exposed for its fear. Saul is exposed as the poser leader that he is. But he will also reveal David, and David's name means beloved. He will reveal the beloved one who comes into the middle of it. Now David walks in the scene, but just a few days earlier, he wasn't allowed to be here. He was too young to go to battle, so he was out in the shepherd's field. And in the shepherd's field, he was tending sheep. The only reason he's here is because his dad gave him a chore to do and to take some cheese and crackers to his brother's. And I love the Bible because it says that David got up early and he goes to his brothers to obey his father. See, while David's brothers were out watching the war, David, unbeknownst to him, had been training for battle. And in this moment, David steps into the scene and he sees what others can't. He risks what others won't, and he trusts when others don't. And the question this morning is, why? Why is David able to see an opportunity where everyone else sees a threat? Why is David able to keep walking in faith when everyone else is paralyzed by fear? 
And the answer to these questions lies back in the story, and I want to read verses 32 through 37, make some comments to us today about three clues, I think, for us if we're going to step into our defining moments and three clues to becoming an overcomer. Here they are, verse 32. This is back in the story that gives us the interpretive key. It says this, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Here's the big interpretive key. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Three clues from this passage of scripture of what it looks like to live an overcoming life. First one is this. David sees what others can't because David has been where others haven't. David sees what others can't because David has been where others haven't. What I'm trying to say is this. David's defining moment for God is not David's first moment with God. That back in the mundane places, the shepherd's field, the places that no one sees, David is cultivating a life that at some point people won't be able to help but notice. That it's in the mundane places that he's doing small things. And it's in the small things that he begins to realize what big things might be possible. We were in a room like this and probably across this room, many of you want to live a life that matters. Many of you want to live a life that makes a difference. You want to do big things for God. But the secret of doing big things is doing lots of small things because it's in the small things you begin to see what big things might be possible. So think about how to demonstrate that to you today. And so I pulled in a little toy called the the jack-in-the-box. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have virtual toys the way that everyone has virtual toys today. We had real toys. Um, We didn't have, you know, the PS5 and, you know, the, uh, all the different, uh, I had an Atari 2600. That was my day, all right? Atari 2600. And and, and then we had real toys like a jack-in-the-box. And maybe some of you can remember back to the days when kids grew up with toys like this. Maybe you grew up with this. And the thing about the jack in the box, I remember the first time I played with it as a kid, you're supposed to take the handle and you turn it. You guys remember the jack in the box? You remember the song that goes along with it? Ready? Here we go. All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. The weasel thought it was all in fun. Ah! Right, like there's that moment there, right? Goes the weasel, right? Yeah, yeah. And what did you do as a kid? You took the jack in the box and you threw it to the corner of the room, right? Because it scared you. You're like, what in the world? What kind of parent would give their toy, give their kid a toy like this, right? But what happened to you as a kid? As you began to play with it more and more, it's interesting, you began to recognize the tune. And as you began to recognize the tune, you began to look forward to that which you used to be afraid of. This is the way our relationship with God is. Oftentimes, you come against story, you you come against struggles and, and, and threats. But it's as you begin to move in the mundane with God, seeing God overcome these things that are small that you begin to be able to trust him with things that are big because you recognize the tune. See, everyone wants a great story, but no one wants a great struggle. Everyone wants a testimony, but no one wants a test. You can't have a testimony without a test, and you can't have a story without a great struggle. But it is in the mundane places, the normal places, that we learn to rescue, we learn to recognize God's tune of deliverance. 
David sees what others can't because he has been where others haven't. Let me say it clearly. Faith for the battlefield is formed in the shepherd's field. Faith for the battlefield is formed in the shepherd's field. Second, David risks what others won't because David values what others wouldn't. So number one, David sees what others can't because he has been where others have it. Number two, David risks what others won't because he values what others wouldn't. In other words, David has built a past with God, but David's not stuck in the past with God. He's living from his past, but he's not chained to his past. He knows his past is only as good as it begins to fuel a future. Um, I, I, a couple of years ago, got an opportunity to go to Israel and to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. It was something that I've wanted to do all my life because I've spent so much of my life reading this book and I wanted to see the scenery. I wanted to step into the places. And I loved going to Israel and just the opportunity to be in the same places that Jesus was, to walk in his footsteps, to see so much of the imagery of the Bible come alive. But I remember before I got there, people told me that uh, had been there that one of the disturbing pieces is that as you go to some of these places, it, it's a little bit hard because in these places, oftentimes there's a church that's been built and oftentimes a gift shop and there's a little bit of a commercialization that kind of keeps you from authentic experience. And the reason these churches are here is because Constantine's mother wanted to honor God, and, and one of the things that she wanted to do is to go to all the different holy sites and to build a church on them. But here's the thing, thousands of years into the future, what she built as a monument to honor God now stands in the way of authentic experience. And I want to bring that up because this is your and I's tendency. When we get great God moments, our tendency is to build monuments on those moments. But the way we honor God when we have God moments is not by the monuments we build, but by the movements that we create. Maybe the way that we honor those who have gone before us is not with the monuments that we create, but with the movements that we build, the lives that we choose to live, the best way to honor the dead is the life you choose to live. And I gotta talk to us about that today because we live in a Christian world. I get a chance to be in lots of different churches as a coach and a consultant. And especially on the days, on the backside of COVID, there's this tendency to wanna just recreate what was on the front side of, of COVID. Now, all throughout the Bible, God will call us to remember. Deuteronomy chapter 8, the people of God are on the edge of the promised land. And so many times there, no, uh, Moses says, remember, remember, don't forget, remember. The Bible always calls us to remember, but it never calls us to live in nostalgia. See, nostalgia happens when you try to recreate the past. God always calls us to remember the past, but we remember the past in order to create the future. I wonder how many of us are stuck in the past with God right now. You've created a monument and you've chained yourself to a past trying to live in nostalgia to recreate it when God is saying, yes, I work there. Yes, I want you to remember that. But with that moment, don't create a monument. Dare to spend your life fueling a movement. Remember the past, but create the future. I think the world is waiting, not for the church to return to where it was before COVID, but a different kind of church to rise up post-COVID that says we see what is, but we also believe in what could be, what will be, what should be, what must be. And God is waiting for a church who will stop simply bowing down to monuments and instead create a movement because when you do that, you get out of the way of authentic experience and the movement of Jesus 
begins to shine through who we are. David sees what others can't because he has been where others haven't. David risks what others won't because he values what others wouldn't. Finally, David trusts when others don't because he has experienced what others didn't. In other words, David's great hope and trust is not in himself. His great trust and hope is in the goodness of God. The God who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from the Philistine. See, trust is not something you know. Trust is something you experience. As little boys, you know, play that game where they jump to their dads, they jump to their moms. It's one thing to know that my dad can catch me. That's not trust. Trust is me jumping. Trust is something not that you know, it's something that you experience. And David has experienced the goodness of God. This is huge because I gotta tell you, I grew up in church And as I grew up in church, I knew that God was right, but I didn't really believe that God was good. I thought that God was kind of arbitrarily right, just kind of testing me. But ironically, through one of the deep valleys of my life, when my college soccer dreams were coming to an end because I was having my second ACL reconstruction surgery and I lost my meniscus on my left knee and I'm looking up at God and I've got all kinds of questions saying, why are you picking on me? All my heathen buddies that are playing soccer, their their knees work well, but now all of a sudden, my dream is crashing. Why are you picking on me, God? I don't get you. And it was in the middle of that valley moment that I discovered the goodness of God in a way that I've never gotten over. I travel for a a living and I'm often doing coaching, consulting, communication, which means I'm on the road probably between 100 to 130 days a year. And at different points in time, those are extended road trips. And when I come home from those road trips, especially when my kids were little, uh, we would have just, you know, daddy and kid day. And when Emma, my oldest daughter, was uh, our only daughter at the time, I would come home from a trip on the road, we'd have what I called daddy Emma day. And on Daddy Emma Day, we could do whatever Emma wanted to do. And I remember uh, one particular time I'd been on the road for like two weeks. I came home and uh, I reunited with Kim and Emma. I said, Emma, tomorrow is Daddy Emma Day and we can do whatever you want. And I was living in Greenville, South Carolina at the time. She said, Daddy, I want to go to Frankie's Fun Park. Frankie's Fun Park is this great place of miniature golf and video games and food and different things like that. I said, Emma, we can go to Frankie's Fun Park. We're gonna spend tomorrow at Frankie's Fun Park. And she looks at me and she says, Dad, is it open? And the reason she's asking, Dad, is it open is because sometimes when Kim, her mom and I don't wanna go to Frankie's Fun Park, we say that Frankie's is closed, right? I said, no, it's going to be open tomorrow. Frankie's is amazing. We're going to go down there. And so we, we go to sleep that night. We get up the next morning. We're so excited. We load in the minivan. And yeah, students, I did say the minivan. You swear your life will never go through the minivan. And then all of a sudden you have three kids. You're like, this is remarkably convenient, you know? And so we're in the minivan and we've got the princess songs, the Disney princess songs on. And we're thumping to the Disney princess songs because Emma loved that. So we're heading down to Frankie's Fun Park. We stopped by Taco Bell because Emma loves tacos and daddy loves tacos too. And so we're in Taco Bell and we're eating. We're eating our tacos in Taco Bell. And an eight-year-old kid burns through the door, the first thing he does, he just points at me and says, cool hair, dude. It's amazing what an eight-year-old can do for your self-esteem, you know? I'm feeling like Tom Cruise and Maverick in that moment. A little old, but, but, but still doing all right, right? And so we have our tacos, and, and, and we, we uh, get back in the minivan, we go to Frankie's Fun Park, and we pull into Frankie's Fun Park, there's a big sign on the door that says, Frankie's is closed till two o'clock. I go from Tom Cruise to Clark Griswold in that moment right there because Wally World is closed, right? And my daughter, she's not old enough to really be aware of time and so all she sees is me pulling the car out of Frankie's Fun Park parking lot and she just starts bawling, crying. 
And I'm trying to explain to her, you know, that there's a, there's a function and we can come back at 2 o'clock, but she doesn't get 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock. All she knows is that daddy's made some promises that it looks like daddy's not going to deliver on. She's got all kinds of daddy questions in this moment. And she's just bawling, crying, and I guess it would have been with my power to jump the fence and, you know, join the private party, but I thought, no, this is their time. And so we, 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 we pull out, we go to my wife's sister, Christy's house, and we hang out for an hour, but my daughter, Emma, is just unconsolable. She can't believe that daddy said we're going to Frankie's Fun Park, and now we're not at Frankie's Fun Park. Finally, after forever, an hour passes by, we get back in the minivan, we go to Frankie's Fun Park, and now Frankie's is open, and now we're playing miniature golf, and now it's all about making hole-in-ones, because my daughter, Emma, is very competitive, and so I'm helping her putt. She makes like seven hole-in-ones that day. I'm putting behind her, I'm making nothing. She looks at me and says, I'm a much better putter than you are, Dad. Remember, after we got done, we played some games, and then we went to Brewster's because she loves Brewster's ice cream, and so we got chocolate ice cream with sprinkles on top. Now it's about 4 o'clock. We're driving home. My wife, Kim, calls, and we're talking. She says, well, let me talk to Emma, and and Kim and Emma are on the phone, and I hear Emma at 4 o'clock say, I have the best daddy in all the world. Yeah, it's not what she was saying at 1 o'clock. At one o'clock, she had all kinds of daddy questions. At one o'clock, she had all kinds of daddy issues. At one o'clock, it looked like daddy had broken his promises. But at four o'clock, she says, I have the best daddy in all the world. This is the story of 1 Samuel chapter 17, but it's also the story of all the Bible. At one o'clock, Abram is there and God has told him his descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And wow, we got a picture of that this week. And the sand on the seashore. But at one o'clock, all Abram sees is is that my wife is barren and my world is broken. At one o'clock, he's got to have all kinds of daddy questions. At one o'clock, all kinds of daddy issues. But at four o'clock, God gives him a son named Isaac that through him, all the world is blessed. At one o'clock, Moses and the Israelites are on a run out of Egypt. The only reason they're there is because God has given them a dream to leave Egypt and move to a promised land. At one o'clock, Pharaoh's army is chasing them down on one side. They've got the Red Sea on the other side. At one o'clock, it looks like God has broken his promises. It looks like God is not going to break through. But at four o'clock... Israel realizes they serve a God who can even part the sea. At one o'clock, Daniel's in a lion's den. The only reason he's there is because he served God faithfully and prayed in the midst of a government that was shutting prayer down. At one o'clock, Daniel's in the midst of the lions. At one o'clock, he's got to have all kinds of God questions, all kinds of God issues. But at four o'clock, he realizes he serves a God who can shut even the mouths of lions. At one o'clock, Esther's walking in front of a hostile ruler. The only reason she's there is because she's won a beauty pageant. At one o'clock, she's got to have all kinds of God questions, all kinds of God issues. But at four o'clock, she realizes she serves a God who can turn the heart even of the hardest ruler. At one o'clock, Jesus on the cross has his own set of daddy issues. My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? But at four o'clock, maybe four o'clock in the morning, we realize that we serve a God that not even death has the last word on life. See, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what barracuda are in the water with you. If your life is a sentence, the subject may feel insignificant. The verb may be violent. The direct object may be overwhelming. But the last word, the last word and the best word belong to God. No matter what you're dealing with right now, the life of the other overcomer knows this. If it's not good yet, then God's not done. 
so that we can step into the struggle, we can step into the test, knowing that on the other side of it, there's a story to be written and a testimony that will be heard. So what about you this morning? What is it that you are facing? Maybe you've been in the shepherd's field. now it's your turn. Will you see what others can't? Will you risk what others won't? Will you trust when others don't? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the way maker, that you are good even in the midst of the difficulty. God, right now, I come to you not not just for those that we're preaching today for my own life because the giant looks big. The threat feels real. There's a large part of me, God, that just wants to get back in the boat. But I want you to write a great story in my life and I want you to live a testimony through me and I think we've got some people this morning who want that story and that testimony as well. And so God, today we come to risk our lives on your goodness. Captivate our heart again, God. Release our imagination again. We wanna see and risk and trust. We love you in your name. Amen.